I am Dave Meinhardt. I've been with the Vatacuti Foundation for almost 10 years, and I work with the media department. And I would like to welcome everybody to this Vatacuti Foundation webinar series. We have Vatacuti Foundation CEO Dr. Mahendra Bandari with us. We also have Dr. Shabnam Bashir, who is a former Vatacuti Fellow. And we have Dr. James Kinross from the Imperial College in London, who is going to serve as our moderator today. He's a clinical lecturer in colorectal surgery. and. He just came off a difficult case just in the last few minutes, so I really want to thank him for hurrying to, to get here to be a part of this program. And we're going to turn it over to Dr. Kinross right now. So welcome again, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, it's such a thrill to be with you. It's such a thrill to be on such a global panel uh, and a real privilege to be invited, so thank you so much. Um, as Dave said, my name is James Kinross. I'm a senior lecturer in surgery here at Imperial College in London, and um, I suppose I have two jobs. The first is, is to set the scene of the challenge that we face in colorectal cancer, and the second is to introduce our main speaker. Probably the more important of the, of the challenges is, is the latter. So many of you may have been affected directly by bowel cancer, or you may have family members that have been directly affected, and if that is the case, you are not alone. Colorectal cancer is a global disease. It affects about 1.8 million people globally each year. And it is the second commonest cause of cancer in men and the third commonest in women. And it's got a complex and dynamic epidemiology. It's not constant, it's changing. And it's becoming more common, more common in, in groups of people that we thought were previously protected. So particularly young people and millennials who are now suddenly uh, demonstrating rising rates of this cancer. And there's a rising rate across the globe in countries that are slowly changing uh, their society uh, and becoming more industrialized. And, the, and, the, and the, re the reasons for this are really complicated and we'll hear about this a little bit later on today. And the national strategies that we have to prevent us, uh, to prevent our populations from, from getting cancer are also evolving rapidly. Uh, and, and thirdly, and finally, the treatments are becoming much more precise and more personalized. Treatment of colorectal cancer is by definition a multimodal, uh, a multimodal treatment pathway with surgery still being the core of treatment, but increasingly it's just one treatment in, a, in an evolving uh, portfolio of treatments. So to help guide us through that, we have Dr. Shabnam Bashir. Now, Dr. Bashir was very generous to me when I visited India. I was in Southern India, gosh, I think it must have been nearly two years ago now. And I had the privilege of touring some of the hospitals uh, in the region. And uh, it was a thrill to see the really um, uh, sophisticated uh, standard of care that was being delivered in some of the units that we, that we visited. Um, Dr. Bashir probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway, uh, because it's my job. So uh, she trained in breast and colorectal cancer uh, treatment and trained initially in Tata Hospital, which is, a, if you haven't heard of it, a very famous hospital in Mumbai, uh, and also trained in robotic surgery at the Roswell Park Cancer Institute in, in the US, and in fact was the first uh, Vatikuti uh, colorectal fellow of India. She is a fellow of the Association of Colorectal Surgeons of India and fellow of the Association of Surgeons of India and a member of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow and core founder member of the Rectal Cancer Treatment Outcome Group. That's quite a lot of memberships, uh, Shabnam. You must be very busy. Shabnam has been running a uh, cancer awareness drive and has, has probably reached 120,000 people uh, through her various activities. And she's also introduced the concept of organ-specific colorectal cancer surgery to the Apollo hospitals in Bangalore, which is where I first met, met her. She's also been an ex-founder uh, ex of the colorectal division there. Uh, she's published extensively uh, and has really focused on the importance of cancer screening uh, and obviously in the latest advance, advancements in colorectal cancer treatment, which you're going to hear about a little bit later on. And she's a massive proponent of preventative treatment. And I think if there's one message that will come today, it is that colorectal cancer is preventable. You, we, we don't have to die of, uh, of bowel cancer. In addition to writing lots of papers and, and books, dare I say it, she's published around uh, 11 to 12 different 
uh, indexed uh, articles and books. Uh, and she's also, and, and I think this is important, the first female organ-specific oncosurgeon of Kashmir uh, to be trained in advanced robotic surgery. Uh, and we certainly need uh, a more diverse uh, community of surgeons to help support the diseases that we treat across populations. And she's amongst the very few female colorectal surgeons in India to be trained in uh, cytoreductive surgery, high-pec surgery, and high-pec therapies. These are advanced treatments for complex cancer, where there's often peritoneal disease or disease that affects the lining of the abdomen. So you're in very good hands, uh, and it's real, really my pleasure to help moderate the session today. I know uh, Dr. Bashir's talk will be enlightening. Uh, Dr. Bashir, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks a ton, Dr. James. Uh, you've been very generous. Uh, That's been a very fine introduction. Uh, for those who don't know Dr. Ken Ross, he's doing a lot of work in translational uh, research, and he's worked on eye knife and modifications and published a lot on that. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to have you here, Dr. James, as my moderator. And uh, a few words about the Wadi Kuti Foundation. Wadi Kuti Foundation has been doing great work in the uh, last 20, 25 years. It was founded in 1997, has been working uh, globally to make it sure that if, uh, each one of us is getting trained in robotic surgeries. And uh, doc, uh, Dr. Mahindra Bandaris uh, is the main uh, force behind that. And he's doing a tremendous job, uh, giving us all the options and opportunities and mentoring us all through this. Um, well, um, my uh, job has been made a lot easier by Dr. James by giving a lot of info about the colorectal and what the concept is, what this talk is going, going to be all around about. Uh, just to elaborate that a bit, I would start my presentation. So it's a, a difficult task actually to be talking in 20 or 25 minutes all about the colorectal cancers, but let me see how much this can do. Um, just whilst we're waiting, um, I think it's um, important just to reflect on the impact that COVID has had on colorectal cancer diagnosis, screening and treatment. Uh, certainly in the United Kingdom where I'm based today, we've noticed a, a really dramatic impact on our ability to adequately screen our patients. In March and April of 2020, uh, our endoscopy capacity dropped by approximately 98%, and it took um, uh, a very long time for it to reach back up to its pre-COVID uh, endoscopy rates. And in fact, we're still not there. So um, we've had to adjust to that new world with the adoption of new technologies and new approaches for screening cancers. And in the United Kingdom, we are aggressively pursuing uh, a different strategy that will be based on perhaps different biomarkers for detecting bowel cancer based on the analysis of, um, uh, of blood in the stool using something called a fit test, but also developing lower cost point of care uh, uh, telescopic uh, or endoscopic uh, devices that we can deploy out of hospital. Uh, and we're finally really considering uh, how we develop that in a scalable and uh, affordable way. Uh, that is better than how we were doing it prior to the COVID pandemic hitting. I thank you, Avadi Kuti Foundation, for giving me this uh, honor and privilege to be able to share a few words about colorectal cancers. Well, before we move in uh, to the colorectal cancer uh, topic, I would just like to give a brief briefing about why exactly are we discussing given cancers. Um, the cancer is called a new age epidemic. So there are 100 different forms of the cancers and currently around 18 million new cases are being detected across the globe and 9.6 million succumb to that every year. So which means one in four deaths are only because of the cancer globally. And 70% uh, deaths are basically in the low middle income group uh, countries. Uh, if you look at the figures in our own country, we're having 8 lakh new cases detected every year. But uh, that would again be an underestimation because we're not having properly uh, maintained registries uh, in all the countries or all the parts of our country also. Around six to seven lakhs uh, are dying every year because of this cancer alone in our country. And uh, fortunate or unfortunately, 30 to 50% of these cancers are preventable. Now, uh, unfortunate because we're not able to do anything about it as of now, we have not been doing much and fortunate because they can be prevented if we do. The global cancer burden currently is costing $1.16 trillion. Uh, and we have 50 huge number, 50.55 million five-way cancer survivors across the globe. And again, let me reiterate that these are underestimation of the numbers. So you can, you can understand the impact. And why exactly do we need to discuss 
about because cancers are conquerable. And this is the message that has to go across. It is not the end, it is just a bend. So please try and understand. There are things that you can do to reduce your risk. And even if we get it, there are things that we do and we can cure. Before we jump to the colorectal part, let me discuss and give a briefing and take this opportunity to uh, tell the audience that uh, the cancers are multifactorial. So there is always an interaction and interplay of many factors, uh, the external factors with your own genetic uh, factors within. So your genetic makeup and its interaction with the outside world determines whether you'll get the cancer and at what age and how aggressive is it going to be. Now, they are uh, grossly, we can divide the factors into physical, chemical, and biological. And uh, physical would be the ionizing radiations, x rays. So, if you, uh, if you have gone to or visited a hospital and you've seen our um, uh, personal healthcare workers who are uh, working in the areas that are high radiation zones, CTs, x rays, um, uh, MRIs, and PET CT areas, they'll be having a dosimeter, which is telling us how much of the exposure are they having. So repeated prolonged exposure to these radiations is one of the factors that can cause cancers in the body. The radioactive substances uh, in the soil or in water in the form of radon, chemicals uh, in coal tar or cigarettes. And a lot many people might not be knowing that uh, cigarette smoke has 7,000 chemicals, different chemicals, and 70 out of that are carcinogenic. And uh, then there are other substances like asbestos, cadmium, aniline, which can cause different cancers in the body, right? From the bladder cancers to kidney cancers, lung cancers. And uh, these the people who are working in these industries, in the dye industries or the rub industries or dealing with the coal tars or pesticides and herbicides have to be very, very careful about it. Then there are biological factors in the form of viruses, bacteria, and parasites. So human papillomavirus is responsible for the cervical cancers, which used recently, recently used to be one of the commonest uh, cancers in women and would cause the highest number of the deaths, cancer deaths in women. And the numbers of the cervical cancers have dropped down to fourth in women, uh, thanks to the robust screening programs around and the preventions because of the vaccinations and awareness drives. So there are other uh, viruses like herpes, Epstein-Barr, and then uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C are the viruses that are responsible in the long run for causing uh, liver cancers. Similarly, schistosomiasis is C associated with the urinary bladder cancers and H. pylori with the gastric cancer. So these are the cancers. If you look at the figures and statistics, we see that the Western population, Western world has brought down the infection related cancers to three or 4%, while as the developing countries are still struggling with 33% of the cancers being just because of the preventable infections. So it's very important to understand that these are very, very preventable causes and we need to do a lot about them. Now, if you look at this figure only, this tells you that smoking is causing 30% of all cancer related deaths. It's just not the lung. Right, and uh, the obesity is responsible for 50% higher risk of breast cancers and 40% higher risk in the colon cancer in women and in, in men. Just reiterating on the figures on this slide, looking at this, you understand how important and how preventable these cause obesity, colon infections. All four are preventable causes. So this is what we need to understand. Now coming to our main topic, which is colorectal cancers. Uh, if you look at the statistics given in the Global Con 2020, it's the third most diagnosed cancer in men and second most in women currently. And worldwide, we are having 1.5 million new cases every year. So it's accounting to roughly 11% of all the cancer cases. And it is most commonly diagnosed cancer in a few countries. In 10 countries, is the most commonly diagnosed one. So looking at the figures, it's, it's alarming. Uh, the number of the CRC-related deaths is estimated to be approximately 0.7 million worldwide, accounting for 8% of all the cancer-related deaths. And this is the most common GM malignancy that can undergo resections. And the developed world is having higher risk than the developing. Now, there are regions uh, with the highest incidences, Southern Europe, Australia, Europe, Eastern Asia, and North America. And Hungary is having the highest number, highest incidence with the 70 for lakh, and Norway, 29.3 among females. And Hungary is the highest number amongst males. And CRC is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in South Korea, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Yemen, UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, and Slovakia. Now, if you look at these statistics, it says that global burden of CRC is expected to increase by 60% to over 2.2 million new cases and 1.1 million annual deaths by 2030, which is really very alarming. 
why are we reiterating the importance of these screenings and preventions is because this uh, five years uh, relative survival rate of the stage one colon cancer can be up to 92%. And the same survival drops down to 12% or even lesser than that if it is stage four. So there is a need for better screening programs globally. And uh, the introduction of the better screening test initially uh, did show some increase in the incidence rates. That was just because the because of the diagnosing of the previously undiagnosed diseases. But in the long term, it has resulted in the reduced mortality across the globe. So in India, if we look at the incidence that we have over here, it says that uh, it varies in different regions because of different ethnicities. So it ranges between 4.6 to 6 per lakh population, per 100,000 population, which amounts closely to 65,000 new cases per year. But again, it is under estimation. So it is roughly close to one third or one half of the actual numbers because they have not been reported. And the five-year survival of the CRCs is actually decreasing in India as well. And uh, the, the, there are multiple factors for that. One is what we call an entity called early onset colorectal cancers. So early, rectal, early onset colorectal cancers is an entity that we're seeing in our country and in a few other countries like uh, UAE and Saudi. Now there are multiple uh, studies and uh, the, the links that it has and the reasons are the lifestyle modifications has been linked to the different westernization of the diet and more of the junk food and early exposure of the uh, population to certain carcinogens. Uh, for example, the titanium dioxide, the synthetic drugs, or uh, the maternal health and maternal depression has been also linked to the early onset colorectal cancers. And uh, one more thing that I would want to stress upon is that it has been associated with the number of the antibiotic courses that your child is getting in the early uh, life. So it, it has been linked to more than three courses of the antibiotics that kids are getting in, uh, within two years of their age, or uh, if they have, they've got more than 11 or up to 11 courses of the antibiotics in first 10 years of their life. So it's very, very important for all of us to understand that these are very preventable things. And these are the cause, causes of the early onset colorectal cancers and the early onset means more of aggression. Uh, so um, there are exosomal factors also, which we can uh, take care of. I think everything that basically changes or alters the microbiome or the microflora of the gut causes uh, the immunity related changes or inflammation in the gut uh, is linked to your uh, CRC and the other colorectal cancers as well. Uh, the uh, re other reason for decreasing survivors would be late presentations, bad prognostic histopathologies. For example, we in India see more of the bad prognostic uh, histopathology subtypes as uh, like poorly differentiated signet cell carcinomas. The lack of awareness is another cause and the colorectal surgery not being recognized as a subspeciality, then there is a lot of heterogeneity uh, in the treatment protocols that can again uh, increase the mortality. And of course the poor access to the healthcare. So the good news, good news is that 90% of all these cancers are preventable. So uh, when we say 90%, one out of every 10 colorectal cancers are preventable. So basically this uh, colorectal cancer, very uh, respective cancers, they, they respect the normal adenoma uh, dysplasia carcinoma pattern. And uh, they basically start as non-cancerous proliferations of the inner lining of your gut. And it takes normally 10 to 20 years before they can become fully cancerous or full-fledged cancers. So we have got a huge window period of 10 years to diagnose, detect, and uh, remove those polyps uh, in the precancerous forms and uh, prevent these cancers. And hence 90% of them are preventable. So 10% of all these adenomas would basically eventually uh, progress to invasive cancers. And uh, the larger the polyp, the higher the risk of it becoming a cancer. Invasive cancers arising from such polyps basically are called adenocarcinomas and they account for 96% of all the colorectal cancers. Now, uh, there are certain dietary lifestyle choices that can promote this intestinal inflammation, repeated insult inside the intestines and modify the intestinal microbiome or microflora. And they can promote an immune response and both can facilitate the uh, polyp growth and conversion into the cancers. A uh, majority of the colorectal cancers are basically sporadic. So average lifetime risk that the general population has is three to 5%. So 60 to 70% will not have a family history. 
uh, there would be positive family history in 15 to 20% of the colorectal cancers, but there we're not able to pinpoint a single mutation that has caused these cancers. So uh, if, if you have a family member who has uh, colorectal cancer, then this is how you can understand. If you have a family member who has colorectal cancer, uh, had it at the age of 50 to 70, between 50 to 70, then it doubles your risk of having colorectal cancers. It brings it up to 12%. Any family uh, history, any family member having colorectal cancers, uh, which was diagnosed at an age lesser than 50 years, then your risk of getting the colorectal cancer triples. More the number of the family members involved, more would be your risk of having the cancer. Genetic hereditary colorectal cancers, these are the, uh, these, these account for 5 to 10 percent of all colorectal cancers, and these are the ones wherein we are able to identify a single mutation, genetic mutation, and say that this is because of this genetic mutation. So these are having specific genetic markers. Uh, there are multiple of them, uh, Lynch syndrome is, uh, and its variants like Turcos, Gardner's, and familial adenomatous uh, polyposis, and the attenuated ones, and the hematomatous uh, polyposis, but the most common one being the Lynch syndrome and uh, FAP. Now, if you look at this figure, uh, you, you, you uh, can understand that uh, Lynch syndrome, people with Lynch syndrome would be having higher incidence and higher chances of risk of uh, having colorectal cancers, stomach cancers, pancreatic cancers, and urinary cancers, both men and women. And additionally, men can have an increased risk of having prostatic cancers and women, the ovarian and uterine cancers. Now, since this webinar is being aired by uh, from US, I uh, want you to understand that one in 300, 350 families has syndrome. So it's very, very important for you to know who had what. So what I was uh, reiterating was that uh, it is as common as one in 300 people in US. So people need to understand and get the history of uh, who all had what cancers in the family, because clustering of these cancers in the family can hint that they're having Lynch syndrome, they're having that gene, and their risk of acquiring these, this colorectal cancer or any of these cancers is again higher. So what are the high risk factors? Uh, these are the factors. There are some modifiable factors and non-modifiable non, uh, factors. So we'll start with the uh, non-modifiable ones. The age uh, for colorectal cancers, it usually uh, has started after 50 years. But in US, those over 65 years are about 30 times more likely to be diagnosed than those in 25 to 49 years. And as we already discussed, there is now a new trend of early onset colorectal cancers. So people are being diagnosed uh, with colorectal cancer lesser than even in lesser than 40 years age group and the youngest that I had seen in my career till now is was 16 years and it was so advanced that we actually had to go for excentration. So males are 1.5 folds higher, they are having 1.5 fold higher chances of developing CRC than females. Uh, women are more prone to having right-sided uh, colorectal cancers, which are more aggressive, basically, and having BF mutations than the, they're more aggressive than the left-sided ones. Now, cystic fibrosis is another high-risk factor for developing colorectal cancers. Earlier on, cystic fibrosis patients used not to cross their th teens or adults and now they're living up to 40, 45 years of age. And uh, with that, uh, with, the, with the different and the uh, modified treatments, their, their life expectancy has increased and so has their chances of having colorectal cancers. And they have 10 times uh, higher risk of acquiring colorectal cancers than the general population. Now, there are studies that suggest that cholecystectomy has also been associated with the proximal and right-sided chronic cancers. And uh, this is this, uh, the, the uh, hypothesis is that the, bile, the gut is uh, exposed to a lot of bile, which it doesn't get stored in the gallbladder and exposes the gut to a lot of uh, bilious matter. So uh, concentrated bile. So diabetes mellitus also uh, has been uh, shown to have an, uh, you know, known to predispose towards a lot of cancers and colorectal cancer is uh, one of them because of what we call Warburg uh, effect. It accelerates the glucose metabolism and there are some insulin-like growth hormones, uh, growth factors which are responsible for causing it. So uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus has been associated with it, increased risk of the CRC. And uh, even if you're doing adjustments for the BMI, physical activity, and other shared factors, still a diabetes uh, single-handedly and independently is responsible for increasing the risk of colorectal cancers. 
uh, the personal history, family history of the colorectal cancers again, and the polyps would put you at a higher risk. Inflammatory bowel disease, as Dr. James was already saying, he, he has the rush from the OT doing an IBD case. So inflammatory bowel disease in the form of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's increases the chances of having colorectal cancers by 12 fold. So there's a lot of inflammation, release of the cytokines, inflammatory substances, there's angiogenesis, increase in the blood flow, metabolic free radicals are there. And these factors predispose towards carcinogenesis. The family history of inherited CRC, we have already discussed. Genetic syndromes like FAP and HNPCC put you at a higher risk. Uh, earlier on, urotrocolic anastomosis was very common uh, for bladder cancers also. So whenever we join in the, and the colonic segment, that region is predisposed to colorectal cancers. Long-term immunosuppression following the organ transplantation, especially in the renal uh, transplant patients, has been associated with early onset colorectal cancers. It might not increase the risk per se, but it can cause two colorectal cancers in an earlier age. So androgen deprivation therapies, orchidectomies, or gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs, if they have been given for more than two years in prostatic cancers, they, this also can increase the chances of colorectal cancer slightly. Then radiation to the pelvis for prostatic or cervical cancers, they have also been associated with the increased risk of uh, having rectal cancers. HIV patients also have an increased risk of having colorectal cancers. And then obesity, especially the people who are having truncal obesity around the bellies, fat around the bellies. Obese men have a 50% more risk of having colonic cancers. And every five kg weight gain would increase your chances of having colorectal cancers by 3%. So sedentary habits and inactivity, that is another modifiable factor. We are, we are discussing the modifiable fa factors now. So uh, if you're physically active, you're, uh, it will lower your chances of developing colorectal cancer by 25%. And the obesity is independent of the risk conferred by physical activity. They're cumulative. So if you're obese and then you're inactive, it, it is increasing your chances of colorectal cancer by many folds. But if you're obese and still trying to maintain that 20 to 30 minutes of activity every day, it reduces your risk by 25%. As we have already uh, spoken about smoking and it's 70 carcinogens and one cigarette. So it not only causes the colorectal cancers, but it is more likely to cause tumors that are more aggressive, that are associated more of molecular uh, changes and mutations and BRAF mutations and the factors that are uh, associated with poor prognosis. So it increases the risk as well as the aggression of the tumor. Alcohol due to three alcoholic beverages risk per day consume, increase your chances of having colorectal cancer by 20%. And if the drinks are more than three a day, then your chances of getting colorectal cancer get increased uh, 40 to 50%. Uh, there's been, there have been a lot of studies uh, around the diet and role of the diet in causing or preventing colorectal cancer. So diet has a very significant uh, impact on the microbiome of the colon. So a red and processed meat has been associated with higher risk of the colorectal cancers so in the form of sausages, hot dogs, smoked tandoori. But there is a word of caution over here. So WHO has declared red meat as potential carcinogen, but processed red meat is a carcinogen. So it is not just the red meat, it is the way it was cooked. So if your red meat was processed, it was subjected to higher temperatures for sh shorter duration, then it is uh, a carcinogen. If it is traditionally cooked, simmered at a lower rate, and your consumption is less, then your uh, risks are still a little lesser. But uh, consumption of 100 grams of the red meat, processed red meat, every day increases your chances of getting colorectal cancer by 1.16 fold. Now, the other uh, hardest factors are synthetic dyes, as in ESO dyes used by the industry for a lot of uh, dyeing processes the MSGs in the preservatives and all other substances. So they are again, one of the very common factors for causing colorectal cancer. Titanium dioxide, I want to reiterate on this fact because this is one of the factors that is responsible for increasing incidence of the early onset colorectal cancer. So titanium dioxide is basically a substance that is used to brighten your dietary uh, dairy products or your candies and frostings. So you, the kids are getting exposed to this at early age. If you don't uh, check on that, you don't control that, then uh, there would be increased chances of having early onset colorectal cancers. And high fructose corn syrup is also one of the highest factors and it is quite modifiable. Now, uh, the concept of prevention in colorectal cancers, it has uh, 
behavioral component and uh, the effective prevention is possible because there are a lot of factors that are modifiable and can be controlled and changed to reduce your risk of having colorectal cancers. Uh, calcium and vitamin D supplementation is one of them also. It is shown to have a protective effect. The role of vitamin D in multiple cancers has already been uh, proven in studies. There is no level one evidence, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of studies, a lot of uh, trials are suggestive of its protective role. So there's no harm fortifying your diet and getting supplementations uh, of calcium and vitamin D. Then folate supplementations have a controversial role. Uh, it, it is uh, shown to inhibit the carcinogenesis, but once that has set in, once there's an existing tumor, it can actually promote. So it's a complex relationship. We do not advise folate supplementations unless the patient or the person is pregnant or unless they're having specific certain uh, mutations or genetic disorders wherein the supplementation is a must. So fiber found uh, uh, in fruits and veggies and whole grains are very protective because they uh, promote a faster transit. So the contact time between the carcinogens in the uh, stool or the um, chemical irritation because of the stools is lesser. So the exposure to those carcinogens is also lesser. And additionally, they are having an antioxidant effect as well. The other potentially protective foods are garlic, magnesium, fish, vitamin B6, and turmeric. Now, uh, cessation of smoking alcohol, I can't stress more on this because of the factors that we already discussed, 30 to 40% uh, risk of the cancers are just because of these two factors. So this is quite preventable, quite modifiable, physical activity and reg regular exercise again. Now, long-term NSAIDs like aspirin have also been shown to reduce the risk as well as the aggression of the tumor. But then the risk there is the uh, higher chances of the GI bleeds. So it's not generally recommended for the population as such for prevention of the colorectal cancers. Nevertheless, U.S. Prevention Task Force does recommend a low dose aspirin for those over 50 years of the age who are having heightened risk of the cardiovascular diseases or colorectal cancers. Now, the combined use of statins to lower your cholesterol level as well as the aspirin in a five-year case control study did show a 62% decrease in colorectal cancers, uh, than, uh, which is greater than the effect of either of these two drugs alone. And uh, there have been certain um, talks about the uh, protective role of hormone replacement therapy after menopause, but the studies have proved it to be controversial. Uh, and uh, so, same is the case with the oral contraceptives. Once they were believed to reduce the risk of colorectal cancer, although the studies have not shown any evidence in support of it. But oral bisphosphonates uh, that we give for prevention and treatment of the osteoporosis, they can reduce the risk of the colorectal cancers as they modify the immune response to the cancers. They inhibit the tumor angiogenesis and invasion and addition. Uh, and called ACE1 inhibitors are basically used for the treatment of the high blood pressure or hypertension. They have also been associated with a decrease or reduced risk of the colorectal cancers, but the benefits of this treatment usually uh, level off after five years. This is not given to prevent, but this is uh, an additional um, good effect of the medication if somebody is taking it for the hypertension, but the, the, uh, the benefits would uh, 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 wane away, they would level off after five years of use. There are some studies that do suggest that metformin that we give to lower the glucose level in diabetics also has some protective role. But again, its use for preventive measures of colorectal cancer is not there, but it is an added advantage of, uh, for the people who are taking metformin. Now, if you have a quick look on this slide, you'll see that there is a common factor that decreases the risk in all these uh, cancers the commonest cancers, breast, colorectal, lung, oral, prostate, and stomach. And that's your physical activity. That's a lot of fruits, that's vegetables, and uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. And that's reducing your weight. And uh, th then uh, th there is uh, another thing that is very important uh, is that you have to have uh, seven to eight servings of the cereals, grains, your rice, your legumes, the beets, radish, and carrots. Please uh, do not try to uh, take off certain uh, valuable uh, nutritive components from your food, just because you think that uh, it might have a harmful effect on your weight and all, you have to have a moderate consumption of all of that because they're all having protective roles. The peas of the potato, the peas of the uh, tomato, they all are having protective role uh, in, in inhibiting the uh, cancer producing, uh, in, in inhibiting the cancers or uh, preventing the cancer, some role. 
And so you have to have a combination of all of that, uh, but the key word is moderation. So you cannot have an excess of uh, anything. Now coming to the screenings, advances in the CRC screening have fueled the reduction in mortality in colorectal cancers in the developed world. Now it's very, very uh, suitable for the population screening than any other GI malignancies because of various reasons, because the incidences are high. So it's the second most commonly diagnosed cancer currently as per Globocon 2020 in women and fourth commonly third uh, commonly diagnosed cancer in men. So uh, screening has a great role in reducing the mortality. Uh, so advanced stage, more the uh, more advanced the stage, more costly the treatment, and more lengthy the treatment. It's multimodality, all about multimodality treatments in that case, and it's it's very important. The screenings are again very important in colorectal cancers, especially the rectal cancers, because here we're talking about the organ preservation, preserving your natural orifice of uh, passage of the stools. Then uh, another reason which makes it very uh, suitable for the screenings is the predictable prog uh, the predictable progression. Uh, from adenoma to carcinoma. It takes usually a long window, five to 10 years. So you have ample time to diagnose and resect those uh, lesions, precancers. And excision of those adenomas and treatment of the early colorectal cancers has actually been shown to have a pro profound impact on the mortality related to the colorectal cancers. Now, the other question that the audience would have is uh, what are the modes by which we do the screening? So a screening colonoscopy has a preventive effect and it would obviously depend on the procedural quality. There are certain limiting factors. Um, the skill of uh, the gastroenterologist in that case or somebody who's doing uh, the colonoscopies, then how prepared was the bowel, uh, the, whether the procedure could be completed or not, whether there were any complications related to the procedure and the patient burden scores. Capsule endoscopy basically cannot remove the polyps and cannot detect the lesions less than 6 mm, and it's not generally recommended for screening, but it can be used in cases where the patient has refused colonoscopy because of the fear, or we have not been able to complete the colonoscopy because of any reason. But a stenosis of the gut or obstruction would be in contagion for screen uh, for capsule endoscopy because of the fear of retention of this capsule camera inside. CT colonography is another substitute. Uh, for colonoscopy, it's a uh, it's what we call a virtual colonoscopy. We use air as contrast, and CT can do the colonography again. L role is limited. Uh, the sensitivity is very low for smaller lesions, uh, lesions of six to nine mm, and false positivity, high false positivity is there. Other lesions can be missed as colorectal cancers, and it's uh, generally not recommended for polyp adenoma screening. But the indications again would be the same as the capsule endoscopy if the patient is refused, or uh, if you've not been able to do a colonoscopy because of complete colonoscopy because of any other reason. And then, uh, especially the obstruction. So biomarkers for the CRC screening uh, are there. We are having a fecal ocal blood test, and we are having fecal immunochemical test. So FIT and FOBT are there. And uh, FIT has been seen to have greater sensitivity. So the difference between the two would be that uh, the FOBT requires to have three uh, different uh, tests on three consecutive days. And all the three have to be negative before we call it a negative FOBT. And uh, the drawback of the FOBT is that there are a lot of interactions with the food that you have taken and the medications that you have taken. So there can be alarmingly high false positive results also. But uh, FIT has an advantage that only a single test, single day is required, and it does not have any interactions with the food that you've taken or with the medications that you've taken, and it diagnoses the bleeds from the lower GI tract. So recent systemic uh, reviews show that there's a reduction of 12% in the colorectal cancer mortality because, in, uh, because of the uh, FIT being used uh, for screenings over the period of 15 years with biennial FITs versus no screening. So there's one more test that we call multi-target stool DNA test. There's higher sensitivity for detection of colorectal cancers and advanced adenoma, but specificity is low and specificity decreases with the age. So there are higher false positive results with this. Annual FIT with colonoscopy every 10 years uh, is more effective and less costly than the uh, multi-target stool DNAs. Uh, the other question that uh, people usually ask is, what is the age of a screening? When, when should we start getting screened? So for the general population, it is 50 years, but the regions which have shown the early onset for cancers, it goes down to 40 years. So that would be uh, actually India, and but we are uh, resource limited. So then uh, the other countries are uh, UAE and Saudi. 
And a family, if you're having a family history of coronary cancer, this is for the sporadic population, sporadic coronary cancer for general population. If you're having family history of the coronary cancers or any hereditary uh, genetic mutations, then the age at which you should start getting screened is 40 years or at least 10 years younger than the next case in your family. The age at which any of your family members had coronary cancer 10 years before that, a decade before that is the time when you should start getting screened. There are different methods. What we, one is what, what we call a one-step method. The other is two-step. So two-step is for the general population, the sporadic uh, cases. We'll do an FIT because it's cost-effective. And then if that is positive, uh, go for colonoscopy. One step would be for all those people who are having already a family history of coronary cancers or hereditary genetic CRC. So there we have to straight away go for colonoscopies. Uh, the other question is what is the interval to go for these uh, screening programs? So average risk population, you can do annual FITs and FOBTs are good enough. And then colonoscopy every 10 years if you've not been diagnosed with any polyp in the previous colonoscopy. And the screening can be stopped at 75 years of age. Uh, unless uh, the individual is very healthy and they are very keen to get screened, uh, it, usually the studies don't show any uh, survival benefits after several years of age, as long as screening is concerned. The screening is when we are trying to diagnose it before any signs and symptoms have set in. Uh, the question that the audience might have is, what are the signs and symptoms if we get it? So you'll have a change in the bowel habit. Uh, so if you're already constipated, you might have uh, loose tools. Or if you're having loose tools, you might have constipation now. And if that goes for around two to three weeks, then it's the time that you should actually get tested and it should alarm you. Especially if you're falling into any of those high-risk groups or if your age is uh, 50 or more. Then uh, you can have a sense of incomplete evacuation. So you feel you pass, pass the stools, but you still feel that you've not evacuated completely. That could be one of the signs. Uh, blood in the stools, or once you've passed your stools, your motions, you can see some bleeding coming out of the rectum after that. Then if your stools are narrower than the usual, they've started getting narrower than the usual, although that would mean that there is stenosis and it's already advanced, but then that could be one of the uh, signs and symptoms. Uh, if it has started getting stenosed or growth as much, it is uh, obliterating your or uh, narrowing down the lumen then the other symptoms that you would have or you could have is abdominal pains and cramps, uh, bloating, distensions, and fullness. Weight loss would uh, usually come quite late. It's a sign of advanced cancers. Anemia could be one of the uh, uh, presentations, only anemia, uh, especially in the right side of colonic cancers because they are, they are, uh, the uh, lumen is wider, so the obstruction is not very early. So you, you can just bleed and you, you can be treated for anemia, evaluated for anemia without knowing that you're actually harboring a right side of colonic cancer. Weakness and fatigue could be one of the symptoms. It again, is basically associated with the advanced diseases. Well, um, hemorrhoids can be a very, very, very rare presentation, but it can be one of the presentations in the rectosigmoid cancer. So if you're falling in high-risk category, if your age is more than 50, you're having or in the high-risk factors that we have already discussed and you're having hemorrhoids, please uh, do not get treated for hemorrhoids unless you have at least had a flexible sigmoidoscopy or if any doubtful area has been already biopsied. Now, how do we diagnose if you come with the signs and symptoms? We obviously would take a detailed history, your family history, try to look for the high-risk factors that you might be having, physical examination, digital rectal examination, proctoscopy, it's an outpatient uh, uh, investigation, and then flexible sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy. Colonoscopy stays the gold standard. So in colonoscopy, the benefit is that we can do polypectomies in the same go, so the smaller lesions can be removed and we can take the biopsies also. also. Uh, then CT colonography, again, the capsule endoscopy and CT colonography will have the same um, indications as we already discussed. CEA, uh, the carcinoma embryonic antigen is basically more of a, a prognosticating factor than uh, diagnostic. So we take these, if the tumors are secretory, there will be higher levels of CEA. And uh, generally, CA levels are a little more in the smoker than the non-smokers. So have to have a baseline level. And once we follow up uh, during the treatment, after the uh, completion of the treatment, we'll have a look on the CA level. That can tell us whether the cancer is coming back. So it can precede the imaging uh, and give, give us a hint whether we need to do anything else in the follow-up or not. Then biomarkers and multi-target stool DNA, we have already discussed. Uh, now how do we stage the other question that you might be having? Uh, 
I'm not going to go into the details of the TNM classifications that we have because I, I don't think that is required for the general population. What you need to understand is that stage zero would be a stage wherein it's still in the epithelium, in the lining. And when it goes into the muscle or it crosses the muscle, it becomes stage two. Stage three is when it involves your nodes. And stage four would be when it has gone to the other organs, whether the, they are the organs in the pelvis or the distant metastasis. Uh, so depending upon that, when in, in the difference between the colorectal cancers and the other GI malignancies is that even in stage four, a limited stage four, we are still able to provide cure and the intent is cure if the stage four disease is limited. So that is, it is very, very important for you to understand that even stage four disease is not a death sentence in colorectal cancers. So please don't shy away from getting uh, evaluated and treated and uh, going to your uh, clinician for that. So how do we stage? We do a local staging of the disease and distance staging. For local staging, we have to do an MRA of the area to know whether it's a bad prognost prognosticating disease or it, uh, it is a good disease and whether we have to do an upfront surgery for you or we can offer you uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy to downsize and downstage this. If the tumors are very, very small, we can go for endoscopic ultrasound and uh, see whether they're amenable to just wide local excision and if they have not involved the uh, regional nodes. For distance staging, we have to have a look at least at the lung liver and rest of the abdomen uh, because that uh, gives us an idea of uh, how bad the disease is, what is the prognostication and what should be the step, how should we deal with the cancer, how should we plan your treatment. There would be different treatment modalities. So surgery still the mainstay, whether it is the, the local excision through the anus or whether it is open surgery, minimal invasive surgery, robotic surgery. Uh, the surgery would depend upon uh, the extent of your disease and the location of your disease. So we can remove a part of the colon. We might have to remove the whole of the colon if there are multicentric cancers in your uh, colon. If you're from the high risk category like FAP or HNPCC, and uh, we might uh, have to remove the whole of the rectum, part of the rectum, we do a very low anastomosis. And we are more and more uh, actually trying to reiterate the fact of early diagnosis because it's about your organ preservation. And we are trying to do what we call precision oncology, precision surgeries, precision treatments for your cancer. So one part is preventive, the other that we uh, reiterate is uh, precision. We try to preserve the sphincters, we go very low and minimal excess surgery and especially robotics has made that possible that we can go really low down into the pelvis and still save your natural orifice or remove the uh, one of the sphincters, leave the other one, which takes care of the control over the period of time with the trainings. Uh, then we might, but unfortunately, sometimes we might have to go beyond the sphincters, remove any of this uh, part of the vagina or part of the uh, seminal vesicles or part of the prostate if it is involved, or we might have to go even more extensive and do extra levator APRs uh, or what we call uh, eccentrations and removing um, bulk of the pelvic organs. So uh, the, the surgeries for more advanced uh, cancers would be more extensive, and hence we are trying to... Um, uh, make the public understand the importance of screenings, prevention, and early detection. Uh, the earlier, the better, obviously. The other modality is uh, chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is when your medical oncologist would be giving and infusing certain medications into your body. And they generally are different. They are different regimes, different medications, depending upon the type of the cancer you're having, the location, the uh, histopathological variant that you have, your hypersensitivities to certain drugs. But generally, it is uh, four to six cycles, and it is it usually finishes within five months of the time. Radiation therapy is another modality. So we the, the role of the chemotherapy basically is more so to prevent the distant metastasis and also has an impact on the local rectal lens. The radiation therapy is mostly for the field sterilization so that there is lesser local recurrence. There are targeted therapies also, but then targeted therapies again would be depending upon the genetic mutations that uh, your uh, so the your your tumors show, and uh, we'll have to do the genetic markers for that and see. And they are more so uh, important in case of the stage four or metastatic diseases. Same is the immunotherapy. This is what we call precision therapy. So we'll again have we'll have to look into certain uh, molecular biology of your tumor and see whether it is MMR deficient or it is having a microsatellite instability, then in those cases, we can offer immunotherapy. So it's an upcoming thing. And uh, recently enough, we have, we have looked into the impact of the uh, 
integrate chemotherapy and radiation therapy in low rectal cancers, wherein we are uh, thinking about preservation of the natural orifice. And we have data that suggests that there are certain tumors which might completely respond to the integrate chemotherapy and radiation therapy and might show complete clinical and pathological response. So those would be a very small subgroup of the patients where we can offer watch and wait and not do any surgeries at all, but depending upon uh, the other factors. Now, what are the factors that can uh, determine the prognosis in your case? Uh, one is the age. So early onset cancers are more aggressive. So the earlier, the more aggressive. Gender, it's uh, usually seen that uh, the bad prognosis or high risk uh, cancers, ones that are on the right side, colon, and they're more in women, but uh, the mortality uh, uh, because of the colorectal cancers is higher in men, probably because of the other associated high risk factors like more of smoking, indulging in the smoking, in, in, in uh, processed meat, because of the uh, alcohol, increased consumption of the alcohol, because of the trunk obesity and all. So histology again is gonna determine if it's a poorly differentiated cancer, it's a signature cell cancer, then obviously the prognosis is gonna be worse than the other forms. Uh, the higher the grade, uh, the poorer the prognosis, and especially if you have given a new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, and then the response that the tumor has sh uh, shown is not very great, what we call tumor regression grade, has not been really good, then it is an indication that the cancer is not going to behave well. Uh, the higher the stage, obviously, uh, the lesser the prognosis, uh, the lesser the survival. We already discussed that also. So stage one, it's up to 92% five-year survival and stage four, it can drop down to less than 12%. Uh, so other high risk factors, again, are going to have an impact on the prognosis of this disease because smoking, as we discussed, does not just increase the uh, chances of colorectal cancer, but increases the aggression of the cancers as well. So if the patient has presented in obstruction or with perforation, then the, the, that again is a bad prognostic factor. Uh, the right-sided colonic tumors uh, coming to the location, the right-sided colonic tumors are going to behave more aggressively than the left ones. Ethnicity, it is said that there's specific groups which will have bad prognosis. Of, if, if we talk about America, the African-Americans are having poor prognosis. And obviously, the general condition of the patient when, when they uh, come with the disease would determine how it's going to proceed. So how do we follow up after we are giving you the treatment for the colorectal cancer? Generally, there are, there are different schools of the thought. There are NCCN guidelines, the AGCC guidelines. There are different high volume centers across the world that modify the follow-up according to their own resources and the patient burden. But generally what we follow is that uh, for the first two years, we ask the patients to come back three monthly, do physical examinations, digital examinations, X-rays and ultrasound of the abdomen, uh, whole abdomen, and C is, uh, of course, for the prognostication. And annual CT of the chest and CCT of the abdomen has to be done. There are limited indications for the PET CT as well, if it's a recurrence, if it's a metastasis, or if your CA levels are very high, or if your MRI has shown what we call uh, a tran in transit metastasis, some uh, uh, emboli in your vessels, lymphovascular emboli, what we say, then we might go for PET CT scan. And obviously colonoscopy annually. Uh, if the if the colonoscopy somehow was not uh, complete at the at the time we started the surgery, then we have to do a complete colonoscopy within six months of completion of your treatment. And after your uh, second year, between three third to fifth year, you will be asked to come uh, for follow up every six monthly. And after five years, it's annual follow-up. Generally speaking, we say that if you've not had the disease in ten years time, then we can call. Uh, a complete cure, we can call, we can, can say that you're cured of the disease because uh, 75 to 85% of the cases or the recurrences if they have to come, they will come within first three to five years of the uh, treatment. And generally speaking, uh, we do see 30 to 45% of the recurrences in first three to five uh, years of the follow-up. So um, uh, uh, just coming to the summing up of the whole uh, webinar and the presentation. Preventive oncology is the way forward. So what we're looking at is prevention, is screening, is detection at a very early age, because there has been a tremendous change in the modalities, all forms of the modalities of the treatment in the last two decades of cancer treatment. And they, they say that uh, if you want to go fast, you have to walk alone. And if you want to go far, you have to walk together. So it's all about the collaboration between the public and the healthcare personnel. You have to be with us. You have to agree to those screenings. The government has to take initiatives to have screening programs. And uh, we have to collaborate to bring down this uh, risk of the cancers. And it's a long, long, long way. 
before we actually have a world without cancer. So we need to collaborate and work, work together. Hope is the only thing that keeps us going and especially for the colorectal cancers because these cancers are preventable, beatable and treatable. So please get screened, go for the early detections and please remember that human spirit is stronger than anything that can ever happen to it. Stay aware, stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Shabnam, for uh, an amazing talk, uh, it, both in its, its depth and breadth, uh, a comprehensive review of uh, prevention strategies in colorectal cancer. Um, just to speak to our audience, uh, I know we have, speak, we have uh, viewers today from the Philippines and from Iraq and from all across the world. Please do ask your questions in the Q&A chat and we will do our very best to get Dr. Bashir to, to answer them. So, um, Mehak Mishra, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, uh, has asked, um, can you tell us, does constant constipation uh, increase the risk of colorectal cancer? You're muted. There, there is no level one evidence to suggest that, but if you look at the other factors and the carcinogens in your diet and chronic irritation and the basic pathophysiology of the cancers, anything that can cause chronic inflammation, it's an immune mediated uh, process. So anything that can irritate your gut for a prolonged period of time. So chronic constipation uh, can increase your chances of having cancer. So it, it can be a presentation of the colorectal cancers as well as an etiological factor. Could you, um, so, so whilst we wait for some other questions, um, could I ask you, could you give us a bit more insight into the Indian experience specifically? So within India at the moment, what is the strategy for uh, screening? Do you have a national screening program? Is there an attempt to try and build or create a, a national screening program? And if not, what are the challenges for doing that? Um, we've had a lot of discussions uh, about this because I've always been pro-screening and uh, I've always been told that you don't understand the resource impact that it has. Uh, we have uh, screening programs for the breast and we have ongoing screening programs for uh, cervical cancers. But uh, since the problem is that uh, a huge population, it's 1.32 billion, and we don't have the exact figures. We're seeing 65,000 uh, cases per year, but we don't have the exact figures. So uh, still the, probably the organizations, associations and the government do not think it's cost effective to start a screening program per se for colorectal cancers. Um, I think this scenario is gonna get changed if all the peripheral central hospitals are connected to the registries and we are able to basically uh, take a note of all the actual cases in the country because to devise any policy against your enemy, you have to have uh, the, you have to know the actual strength of your enemy. So if you don't know what are the exact figures, it's very difficult uh, to formulate any um, uh, policy for that. So I think all the peripheries should get attached to the central registries and should report the way we had made there. There are, there are certain things that we done. We had uh, tuberculosis was endemic in India. So we had made states that it has to be notifiable. It is mandatorily uh, to be noted and reported. So uh, I think time has come when we have to make cancers a notifiable disease across the globe so that we know the exact figures from all the nooks and corners of all the countries. And we're able to have standardization of the protocols and screening programs. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Wajiha Uruj. Uh, again, apologies if I've not pronounced that correctly. Um, again, you sort of alluded to this in your talks, but what are the major signs we can see in a patient who has colorectal cancer? Um, I think that has been already addressed in the presentation, but I would like to uh, highlight that again. So it can vary from uh, just sense of incomplete evacuation, your change in the bowel habits or rectal bleeding, blood in the stools, abdominal cramps, uh, just bloating and flatulence or anemia, fatigue. Uh, or signs and symptoms because of its metastasis to liver. Sometimes people present so late that they're having uh, already liver metastasis and they're having chronic fatigue and ascites and we come to know that it was because of, you know, right. we've, got, we've got some other good questions coming in now. So I'm going to try and get through as many of them as I can. Uh, Afshan Naz uh, Sheikh has asked, what are the differences between colon cancer and rectal cancer? Um, one is obviously the location. Um, the the uh, they're, they're, uh, the second is uh, the the uh, bo molecular biology. So if we're having colonic cancers, especially the right sided colonic cancers, there are different uh, molecular biologies. There are more of the BRAF mutations. So they, they'll 
be a little more so when it comes to the rectal cancers um, there can be other uh, variants like more of the keras or nras mutations uh, and uh, the presentations would be different colonic cancers usually would present with the fatigue and anemia uh, and uh, the rectal ones usually do present with the actual bleeding for rectum and with the obstruction because the colon is narrower on that side and okay. uh, the, the third thing is about the uh, organ preservation the colonic cancers you you don't have to usually if they're not very extensive you don't have to give chemotherapy it's upfront surgery usually usually always upfront surgery for the rectal cancers it's always multimodality you have to look into the uh, you know uh, the grading and subgradings and subcategories to see whether you have to give anti grade chemotherapy radiation therapy or you have to follow it with the uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy so okay. those are the uh, we, we've had some other questions that I'm going to um, keep going with. So um, there's some good questions actually here. Dr. Abdul Wahid Dar has asked us, is there any, rule for, any role for stool or fecal cancer antigens as routine screening uh, tests or post-treatment tests? And we've had a similar question uh, followed up by another pan, uh, um, again by Afshan Naz Sheikh, who has asked us, what are the new markers used as prognostic biomarkers for colorectal cancer? So, so you did talk briefly in your talk about them, but, but can you give us a look into the future? Where do you think the... Uh, the improvements in screening technologies is going to come from? Uh, I think we are right now, uh, we have already discussed the multi-target DNA stool test. And we have seen its uh, limitations as well, how, how sensitive and specific it is. So those are one of the markers. And uh, instead of the FOBT, we do have FIT, which is immunochemical test again. But uh, how much uh, FIT has a role in screening programs. Uh, but uh, the, the, the other markers are going to, with time, improve and uh, basically be used. The cost effectiveness, uh, uh, cost effectiveness again, is, is a problem. So if you're doing general screening programs, then you have to have a, a, a test which is uh, very feasible, which is cost uh, effective, and which is uh, available everywhere and which actually does have a good sensitivity and specificity and can differentiate the cancers from the non-cancerous lesions. Because if we don't have that, then, then it's of no use. Okay. Dr. Mohammed so Abdul uh, Motaleb has asked us, can we talk about ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease and, and rectal TB? I think that's probably uh, an entirely different lecture in its own right. So I think that's a bit difficult to do today, but I'm, I think that would be an important talk for future sessions. But perhaps maybe um, Dr. Bashir, you could just tell, tell us a little bit about why cancer inflammatory bowel disease is different and what are the risks to patients with inflammatory bowel disease for getting cancer? So the patients with the IBD, whether it's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, it's, it's again immune mediated, it's the autoimmune disorders and colorectal cancers are immune modulated. There is chronic inflammation in the colon. Uh, if it is ulcerative colitis, it's the mucosa. If it is Crohn's disease, it is transmural. The, all the layers of the colon are getting, uh, or the GI tract are getting inflamed. So these increase the chances of having uh, colorectal cancers by 12 fold because of the different markers that they release, there's cytokines, inflammatory markers, there's a lot of angiogenesis happening, there's a lot of uh, irritation happening, and they, they contribute to the carcinogenesis. So it increases the chance by 12-fold. Okay. Uh, James Miko Musico has asked us, I believe, James, you're in the Philippines today, so it's nice to, ta nice to talk to you. Can food supplements or herbal medicines be used during an ongoing treatment for colorectal cancer? Uh, when we are talking about the uh, food, uh, if you talk about uh, the herbal medications, sometimes it's very, very difficult to understand their interaction with the allopathic medications. So I would recommend when you're having your chemotherapy going on, please do not uh, take anything that can have a potential impact on the effect of your uh, on, uh, chemotherapy on the cancers. So after you're cured, then there, you can supplement with the, the, the substances that we have said. So you can have uh, B6, you can have magnesium, you can have calcium, you can have vitamin D. Uh, as long as the herbal things are considered, sometimes it's very, very uh, dicey because we have had cases where they are loaded with heavy metal and other substances and that can um, actually harm 
except for a few that we know like uh, that have a proven role like what we call nano turmeric so that's anti-inflammatory you might take it after you're cured but don't take anything uh, while you're under treatment especially if you're on chemotherapy and radiation therapy because radiation therapy again has to have certain uh, it works on the free oxygen radicals and all that so if, if anything uh, alters that uh, process then it can have a negative impact on the treatment Archie De Los Santos asks us an interesting question. Archie asks us, can a person have colon cancer for years and not know it? Um, as we said that it, it, it usually there's a window of uh, around 10 to 20 years from precancerous to cancerous. So if you're having precancerous lesions, they can give you time. But once the cancer has started, normally it, it is just 15 to 18 months before you actually come to know about that. If you missed it in these screenings and the early detections and not more than that, not usually for like more than two or three years. And I think this will be the last question. We have a question from S. Uh, Shal Shalini. Uh, again, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And she asked the questions, why do right and left-sided cancers have different outcomes? Or do they? I think that also has been actually addressed. The right-sided colonic cancers are associated with the uh, more of the microsatellite uh, uh, instability and more of the BDAF mutation. These are poor prognostic, so the, their outcome usually is not as good as the left-sided ones. So it's all about the molecular biology. It's multifactorial. Okay. Uh, Julia Olson has snuck in at the last minute there. Thank you for your question, Julia. Uh, have targeted therapies or immunotherapies been trialed in patients with advanced colon cancer, uh, particularly with a colovesical fistula is uh, what she's asking. There have been a lot of trials, and we have already said this. Yes, targeted and immune therapies, what we call precision therapy, does have a role. There are limited trials, again, because these uh, treatments are very, very costly, and then the absolute benefit comes uh, in very low figures. So they're not widespread. They're not very widely used. But yes, the targeted therapies have been used, and uh, depending upon what mutations the patients are having, whether they are having KRAS, NRAS mutations, or all RAS mutations, BRAF mutations, then the immunotherapy, what we call the checkpoint inhibitors, again, that's an upcoming, a very interesting topic, and it is showing some amazing role, especially in the advanced colorectal cancers. Uh, but uh, whether it would be feasible to extend it to the whole population because of the cost effectiveness is something that, again, has to be looked into. But the, they are showing promising growth and have been tried. Okay. So I think um, we've had some wonderful questions, and, and clearly some of those um, people in the audience asking questions sound like they are either having uh, treatment for colorectal cancer or they're perhaps looking after loved ones or family members. So. <laughs> So if you are, we wish you very well. And thank you so much for taking the time uh, to listen to us today. Uh, I think, um, uh, you know, we've taken up a lot of your time, Dr. Bashir, and, and you've given us a really wonderful lecture with tremendous insights. Um, I really hope those of you that are listening from all around the world uh, have enjoyed this session. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Bashir will be keen to engage with you further uh, through social media, uh, where I know you're very active uh, in the event that you still have any other questions. Um, I, I think just to kind of again summarize the really the central thesis of Dr. Bashir's talk, which is that colorectal cancer is a chronic disease and it is preventable. Uh, and really, um, the, the, the major uh, function of modern medicine is the prevention of cancer. This is really how we're going to see the, the tremendous uh, advances in cancer outcomes that we desperately need. So. If you are worried and you're having symptoms, please do seek help uh, and your doctor will be able to will be able to help you. Um, so again, all that really remains for me to do is to thank you, uh, Shabnam, for a, a wonderful talk and for giving us your insights. Uh, I know we had some technical difficulties, but I don't think that detracted at all from the, uh, the main mission of your talk, which was extremely well received. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, it was a pleasure and honor to have you as the host and mod moderator. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure, very much. The pleasure's all mine. Uh, and of course, we must also thank our, our, our host. So thank it's you so much. First day for being there and Dr. Mahindra Bandari, sir, for having organized this. I hope the message has gone across and people know the importance of the early detection, prevention, and screening for rectal cancers. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Shabnam and uh, Dr. Ross, to interrupt your uh, surgical 
bent of mind. I don't mean that you left the patient halfway, but always as a surgeon, I've seen that you have a thought process, which uh, if it is distracted, nobody likes, but we appreciate your uh, presence here. Uh, Shabnam, it's, uh, this particular webinar is uh, very, very special for Vatikuti Foundation because Vatikuti Foundation's one of the mission is to train excellent surgeons and uh, uh, to give the background. Uh, foundation is involved in the business of training surgeons at its uh, global institutes. Uh, particularly what you could do, Urology Institute at the Henry Ford Hospital for 20 years. And um, hundreds of surgeons have been trained. But in India, we started the program very late. And Shabnam was one of our first fellows who we trained at different places because foundation is committed to fellows. She was working at the center and she found a deficient uh, uh, in uh, handling the issues. So we revolved her at different places. And today we see what a pleasure it is for all of us to witness her grow to this stature. Uh, uh, to the viewers, uh, those who have attended it for the first time, thank you very much for encouraging our efforts because our team takes a lot of effort to put these webinars together besides the precious time of our uh, experts. Uh, foundation was so far involved in the training of surgeons and working with the hospital. Recently, we have changed our focus to training, the educating the patient. Patient education is very, very important component in the overall recovery of, um, of a patient from the disease and doctor alone cannot do much. And foundation, I, I see there are lots of questions you still have. So I would request you to go to our website. We have a very recent blog on prevention of colorectal cancer. And um, you will always find foundation available to answer your questions. We are in the process of setting up uh, a patient forum. Please come write your questions there. And we will have experts like uh, James and Shabnam. We have a very wide network of people in multi-specialty oncology is our focus and we'll really be happy uh, to take care of your questions and take care of anxieties which have not been answered so far. Thank you very much, all of you. I hand it over to back um, to Dave, if he would have any housekeeping notes. Thank you. I wanna thank Dr. Bashir and Dr. Kenros. Dr. Kenros had to return to the OR and so I want, I know your, your time is very valuable. So thank you very much, sir, for spending part of your day with us. The pleasure is all mine. Really a fabulous opportunity and, and uh, the foundation does such good work. So however I can help, uh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Well, thank you again for your dedication, your time today. I know you have to leave, so I'll say yeah. goodbye to you. Thank you so much, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. And you are already in it that you committed yourself by agreeing to come on foundation function and we'll fall back on you every now Please and do. then. Thank you very the, much. The pleasure is all mine. I look forward to taking part in the future. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for joining us. We had over 100 people here on this webinar, which was a really excellent turnout. Dr. Bashir, you kept everybody here too for quite some time. So thank you. It was good to see you finally via Zoom. And with that, I think we'll let you say one final word of goodbye and we'll we'll close this program out. The pleasure was all mine, uh, Mr. Dave. And thank you very much once again, Vatikuti Foundation, Dr. Mahindra sir, for giving me this opportunity. I hope the questions have been addressed. There, there have been a lot and lots of questions. I think they're beyond the scope of this talk because we had limited time, but they can connect to us to Vatikuti Foundation website or through social media. And we'll be uh, happy to answer all those questions. Thank you very much once again. Yes, you are, are very active in social media. I'm on uh, Facebook. There's a lot of time consumption on the social media. So I'm only on LinkedIn and on uh, the uh, Facebook. So I've already shared that on the uh, through the mail to you. So yes, they okay. can share it with everybody who wants to get connected and they can put their questions there. Okay. With, with that, I'm going to say...
goodbye to everyone that has joined us today. And thank you again for, for all you did today, Dr. Bashir. It was great. Dr. Bhandari, take care, sir. Thank you.